Welcome back to the Popper Metagame. Today we're going to talk about the wacky, the zany songs of the damned combo. So, should be a good time. So briefly, I noticed on the Popper Reddit, shout out to the Popper Reddit, there were a number of people who were interested in this deck because it recently made top 8 at the Channel Fireball Popper Championship with apparently, r rumor has it, over 200 participants competing, which is pretty spectacular uh, for basically a side event. Even though they're calling it the Popper Championship, it's really just a fancy named Popper side event. A uh, quick side note, um, you saw the Blue-Red Delver decks doing well. I've been grinding with different decks lately that are all undefeated against Blue-Red Delver. So if you think Blue-Red Delver is too good, it's a fantastic deck, but it's super extra fair. And if you're not beating it, maybe it's because you're just jamming the wrong stuff. So browse my channel, you might get some ideas. Anyway, moving along, let's get back to the topic at hand. First of all, let's give this deck a grade. Overall, I haven't really played it enough to be able to say with 100% certainty. I feel like this is a super extra medium. We're talking like solidly lower tier 2, upper tier 3, like C plus, C minus. It's very susceptible to graveyard hate, and I mean real susceptible to graveyard hate. So it's kind of like dredge. It can do some busted crazy stuff. It could also fold to graveyard hate. Also, it could fold to counter spells at inopportune times. Uh, speaking of falling into the trap of playing precisely the wrong stuff against Blue Red Delver, that would be this deck. Uh, anytime your key combo piece costs one mana, i.e. Uh, Songs of the Damned, you're going to probably end up in trouble because they'll just throw down a fairy and a fairy trickster counterspell your songs and you'll cry. So, yeah, don't do it. Anyway, but if you don't really care about losing to Blue Red Delver, you just want to jam this thing and have fun, by all means, feel free to do it. If you go on to MTG Goldfish, this is the deck list you're going to find. Frankly, I don't like this deck list. I just... It's, <laughs> really, Wirewood Guardian? That's just... I just... just no. Street Wraith... Okay, so this, this is actually kind of a trap, I feel like. Now, I'm not saying Street Wraith is terrible, but I don't really want to be paying two life just to cycle a creature, just to accelerate that process. It's okay, but it's 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 worse than it looks. Anarchist is all right, but I think totally unnecessary. Demir Houseguard again, okay, but totally unnecessary. This is this Balstrid Spy combo stuff is just trying to get too cutesy in my book. Simian Spirit Guide again, is, yeah, it's, you got to exile the Simian Spirit Guide so it doesn't even end up in your graveyard. And frankly, this deck operates in combos off of having a lot of creatures in the graveyard. Wild Cantor. It's okay. Tender Wall, again, okay. I'm just, this, eh, eh. Lotus Petal, Conjures. This is just this is not how I want to play this deck. And then, frankly, trying to, you know, win off of a Haunting Misery uh, where you're dealing damage based on the number of creatures in your graveyard, this is also really not where I want to be. So, let's talk about if, if you want to try this out, all you have to do is go onto MTG Goldfish, do a search for Songs of the Damned, scroll to the bottom of the page, and you'll see this is basically the only list that comes up. Frankly, I don't like it. Let's talk about my list. So here we go. Let's go. Let's go see what we got here. This is my total one million percent homebrew. I haven't played this a ton, but I feel like it's a lot more optimal than what you're going to find currently out there. I think I four one with this once or twice. Never five owed. Not saying it's perfectly tuned. I've I've definitely run this in less than ten leagues, but I have tried it out. So for the mana base, we're going to have a bunch of cycling lands, just because we don't really need that much land. We're going to have a few bounce lands, we're going to have a few life gain lands, a singular mountain, a few swamps, and yet even more cycling lands. So we're cycling like crazy. Four songs of the Dan. Moments, moments Peace is a maze balls because all you really want to do is stall. And then Knot of the Bone lets you gain two life for each creature card in your graveyard. And the rest of our deck is a whole lot of cycling creatures. All right, that's the video. Okay, all right, there's a few other things to mention. I've got Reaping the Graves as our primary source of recouping card advantage if we need to. What I really love about how I built this deck is the Crypt Rats. Crypt Rats is just great because not only does it double or not only is it a win condition, it doubles as a board sweeper. So let's say you're in a position where it's in the I don't know, like it's turn 7, 8, 9 somewhere in there. You've been cycling a bunch of creatures. You've got enough to do like a Songs of the Damned for like 10. You can't really kill your opponent. But you can more than clear the board with your first Songs of the Damned Crypt Rat. Mm -hmm. And then you're gaining back enough life to gnaw the bone, get all your life back. Mm -hmm. And then 
let's say you hit another Songs of the Damned, another Crypt Rat, game's over. You don't even have to combo all at once. So between Moments Peace and Crypt Rats, this gives you a chance to sort of win over the course of time without having to win all in one turn. And of course, if you pop off a Gnaw of the Bone, you fog for a few turns, cycle a bunch of creatures, double songs, drop a Crypt Rat, boom, kill them in one turn. So I feel like Crypt Rat adds a ton of flexibility. Admittedly, by going with the Moments Peace package, we become even more susceptible to Graveyard Hate. So we're going all in. But, oh, it's so good. So good. Um, anyway, so we've got Lurching Rot Beast, just Cycler. We've got Architects of Will, Cycler. It's worth mentioning you want to you wanna sort of pay attention to how you're cycling your cards out. For example, let's say you've got a swamp and a jungle hollow and a forest. You're probably going to want to be careful not to say use your jungle hollow to cycle a dead shot minotaur for green because you've got a lot most of the time. Okay, most of the time. Obviously, this depends on what's actually in your hand. But you've got a lot more cards that cycle for black than for green. So keep that in mind. Usually your black mana is going to be more valuable. Usually you can do more with it. With the caveat that you definitely have to be careful because from time to time maybe you need double green because you'd like to be able to gnaw to the bone and moments peace. Or if you've popped off a Songs of the Damned, you may have a bajillion black mana and so your other colors become even more important. But basically just pay attention and think about uh, how you're tapping your land and make sure you're doing that optimally. Anyway, so we've got... Horror of the Broken Lands, which cycles for a black. This also doubles as an extra win condition. Sometimes there's just weird games that develop where you just beat someone to death with a Horror of the Broken Lands because you can get it in play, cycle a boatload of creatures. Another bizarro play is having a Horror of the Broken Lands in play mm -hmm. and then popping mm -hmm. off a Songs of the Damned mm -hmm. and then cycling like six creatures, mm -hmm. reaping graves because you... I don't know, you play it a knot of the bone and you flash it back, you get it back a bunch of creatures, you cycle even more creatures and just obliterate your opponent with a Horror of the Broken Lands attack. Mm -hmm. you got to be careful not to get blown out by uh, some kind of fancy removal, but anyway, it's it's an option. Mm -hmm. You've also got Crows and Tusker as a little bit of a sneaky card advantage. It cycles for three, which isn't great, but when you cycle it, you get to search your library for a land card, gives you some fixing, gives you a little bit of an ability to get some land while continuing to cycle your creatures. Also in the late game, again, this gives you an option to just, if it's a bizarro game where it comes down to it, jam a 6-5 beater and go to the face. Mm -hmm. Deadshot Minotaur cycles for a green or a red, mm -hmm. and Monstrous Carabid cycles for a black or a red. Mm -hmm. We've got the singular red mana in our deck, just because from time to time, again, in some strange scenarios, mm -hmm. You just want to jam Monstrous Carabid as a 4-4 creature, which again is really nothing to sneeze at in the popper format. The Affinity deck, for example, basically just goes to the dome with a lot of 4-4s four and, and occasionally gets crazy combos off of Atog. So having a deck that can theoretically jam, I mean, another, again, odd but potentially viable scenario is you've got a Songs of the Damned in hand and it enables you in a singular turn to say play Horror of the Broken Lands along with you know, two, a Monstrous Carabid um, and a Crows and Tusker. So you, maybe you're just able to crap out you know three fatties all in a single turn. That's the kind of thing that Affinity does and sometimes it's able to win off of that. So you can also kind of sort of do that here though usually just sticking to the combo is the best thing. It's very situational. Anyway, the Deadshot Minotaur is kind of cool. There's a lot of flyers out there. So there's some situations where it's actually just good value to jam a Deadshot Minotaur, muck up the ground, and blow up a creature in the air because for five mana you get a 3-4 that does three damage to target creature with flying which is nice because there's a lot of flyers out there. Also, one of the cool things about this deck, uh, it's it's really not great against the Blue-Red Fairies deck because two of your very key cards, Moments Peace and Songs of the Damned, are both the kind of low-cost cards that it's going to be easy for them to start chaining off fairies for counter spells and then picking them up with ninjas and dropping them again. So this is a problem. Having said that, if you somehow can sequence your plays to avoid that, you're going to have a nice later on game because so many of your cards are very expensive, which is actually upside when you're playing against someone who's flashing in fairies to counterspell your low cost spells. So it's not that you, and then of course the Deadshot Minotaur is pretty good against fairies also, but so it's not that you've got no game, oh, and Crypt Rats. If you actually get a Crypt Rat off against the, any kind of, uh, 
Delver deck, it's going to be a good, good time. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you have no chance. It's it's just not not great, not optimal matchup. Okay, anyway, so moving along a little bit here, that, that basically covers the deck. Um, I, I guess I should mention that... Uh, let's see here. Let's skip to the sideboard. I feel better about the main deck than I do to the sideboard, so I guess I should mention that I feel like the, the main deck's a lot more tuned than the sideboard. So having said that, we've got to rest because when our opponent brings in graveyard hate, so hate, hate cards like Relic of Progenitus, maybe we can just get lucky and go first, or before they play it, maybe they have a tap land on their first turn, we pop off a dress, get lucky, and snag their Relic. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can also bring in Raven's Crime against some controlly matchups because we might end up with extra land that we can just afford to chunk. Um, from time to time, this can be a useful strategy to grind. Mm -hmm. uh, an, an extra Reaping the Graves when we've got to get more grindy and try to find extra card advantage. Mm -hmm. I've got a I've got a stack of Fairy Macabres. This is nice because this is able to disrupt anything that's trying to abuse the graveyard. You can do it at instant speed, can't be counterspelled, and it puts another creature in your graveyard. So that's not that's not bad. Plus, in some weird scenarios, you can just jam a 2-2 flyer, which is sometimes okay. <laughs> Next up, we've got Evancar's Justice. Mm -hmm. This is a pretty big game against things like Elves and mm -hmm. Elves. Okay, it's also pretty good against any kind of Delver deck as well. Usually, if you're doing 2 damage, you kill basically every creature in the blue-red uh, Delver deck. And in Mono Blue, you kill everything with their Spire Golems, generally. I guess there's also the Augur Volus, which has 3 toughness, but whatever. Mm -hmm. Next up, we've got a singular death spark. This is just good again against anything that has a lot of one toughness stuff. Pretty decent against Delver decks, uh, which again is not the most optimal matchup, so I wanted to sneak some extra value into the deck. It's You could possibly argue that this should just be an electricery and not be trying to be so cutesy, but since you're just constantly cycling creatures, you're just always going to get this back if you can find your mountain to play it in the first place. Also great against elves, presuming they don't have some way to beef up the toughness of their squad. Mm -hmm. Got a couple of hushes just because, mm -hmm. well, boggles can be pretty nasty. Sometimes you just need to be able to destroy enchantments. Sometimes that's just important. Mm -hmm. The one thing I don't have here that I probably should mm -hmm. is something to kill artifacts to mm -hmm. force the issue. For example, if somebody does put a Relic of Progenitus out there, it would probably be good to go ahead and take that out. So maybe it'd be worth throwing in something in here like, I think, I don't know, maybe a couple of Ancient Grudges, which seems okay. That maybe, for example, we drop a, a Duress and a Raven's Crime, or... Oh, I've also got a Stinkweed Imp in here. Stinkweed Imp's pretty cool just because it's actually a, a nice resilient threat to block. It's also, again, good against Fairy Decks and Delver Decks generally. And it's just a nice resilient threat that dredges, which is actually pretty good for us. So it's just kind of a random thing. This may be a little too cutesy. This might also be something we could cut. Mm -hmm. It's also possible we don't really need three fairy macabs. So maybe we can cut one of those. You've got a lot of options here for what you can experiment with cutting. Uh, maybe you feel like you don't actually need all these hushes. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one little thing that's obvious, but can't catch you off guard if you're not paying attention. Mm -hmm. Hush is a sorcery. So don't try to get too fancy and play it on your opponent's turn because you're a boss. Just, just jam it when you got it when you need to. So, yeah, that's pretty much the deck. Uh, I've already given it the grade, I've broken down the cards, so let's take a minute to talk a little bit about matchups. Again, I'm not a full expert on this deck, although, frankly, I probably know a lot more about this deck than most people, not because I'm an expert, but I know something about the deck and most people know nothing, because it's really obscure. All right, is it Delver? I've kind of broken it down already, talked about it. Uh, the biggest thing you got to watch out for here, again, is the fact they're going to jam these spell starter sprites. So just I, really the whole matchup just comes down to can you dodge these spell starter sprites and how well they utilize their counter spells. Um, coming out of the sideboard, I'm kind of surprised some lists apparently don't have relics, which is uh, amazing. It's amazing. Uh, wow, this is just kind of greedy. I don't know. This does, this is, this is definitely upside. Okay, so here's a list that has a relic of progenitus in the sideboard. If you go up against a blue red deck that, fairy deck that doesn't have a relic in the sideboard, uh, you might, you might just, you might just take them down. It, it just depends. So, but normally they have relic if they do. I mean, that's a huge amount of what these matchups come down to because you're so all in on the, on the graveyard plan. 
Uh, another thing to keep in mind is when you're trying to run off of Knot of the Bones and Moments Pieces, try not to cut it too close, so close that if they counterspell one, you're going to lose because, yeah, they've got just regular good old-fashioned counterspells. So treat, try to keep a little cushion. That's the important part. All right. Uh, let's, let's back. Let's back on up. Let's take a look at a few other matchups real quick. Uh, Cold Uh this... It's the, the, the some of these are starting to happen with Juka Bogs in the main deck, which is a little wonky. Plus relics in the sideboard. This is problematic. Uh, I mean, sometimes you might just you might just go bananas and kill them before they draw what they need to answer you. Their game plan is largely irrelevant. Although I will say, because you're never well, not never, but you're rarely going to be effectively stealing their monarch token. So if they get an early Pal Sentinels and then they chain into a Bojuka Bog or a Relic, it's going to be a rough matchup. If, say, they don't draw their Palace Sentinels and they don't draw their Graveyard Hate, you could pretty easily sneak it out just because they don't have enough aggression or typically enough burn to take you out. Your Knot of the Bones can definitely get ahead of it. But um, I guess another thing I should mention here is you always want to get maximum value with your Knot of the Bones. So Knot of the Bone, again, three mana, gain two life for each creature card in your Graveyard with Flashback three. So this is one of the real tricky elements of the deck that separates, I don't know, the pros from the Joes or whatever, is not getting too greedy with Knot of the Bone, but get, getting just greedy enough and being a little bit greedy because the longer you wait to pop off your Knot of the Bone, the more life you gain. So let's just say somehow you manage to squeeze out one extra turn of waiting, and in that one extra turn, you cycle three more creatures. So you end up in a scenario where uh, you're able to flash it and because of that you gain six more life on the front side and six more life on the back side because of the three extra creatures that's 12 additional life that is not insignificant that could easily buy you an extra turn or two which might get you to your next knot of the bone so on and so forth now one of the ways you can get greedy and do it just right is to cycle your creatures at the end of your opponent's turn cycling is an instant uh, speed effect so you got to be a little bit careful because sometimes you you might be better off to cycle during your turn. Say, for example, if your opponent is tapped out and you're going up against, again, Blue Red Delver just because it's everywhere and people like to talk about it and focus on it. If you're playing as Blue Red Delver and they're tapped out and they can't counterspell, you don't want to wait to cycle at the end of your opponent's turn. You're going to want to take advantage of the fact that they're tapped out, try to cycle into a Songs of the Damned on your turn if you can, because maybe then you can pop off a Songs of the Damned, drop a Crypt Rat, and boom! GG, you just you just had a big turn there. So I mean, all things being equal, though, if you're trying to get the most mileage out of your knot of the bone, typically you're going to want to wait to cycle at the end of your opponent's turn so that you keep all your options open. If you realize you're in a threatening you're in a threatened situation, then you go ahead and pop off knot as as you need to. However, if you feel like you can sneak out a little more time, you're doing okay. Your opponent can't burn you out or something like that, and they didn't kill you on their turn attacking. Now you've got the cycle option at the end of your opponent's turn, untap, maybe even cycle a few more things, and now we nod at the bone. So that's that's an important part of navigating the deck correctly. Stompy is pretty sweet. I mean, all they're doing is beating you on the ground. So between moments, pieces, and knot of the bone, they really have nothing. And look at this. Look at this greediness. No relics of progenitus to be found. If you played this player right here, loving this matchup. Loving it. Good times. Lots of wins. You'll occasionally lose just because you'll get super unlucky. Um, but the deck is fairly consistent. I mean, really, you just need to chain into your first moments, piece, or knot of the bone. You're cycling all your creatures. You're not probably not putting... Uh, any into play so you're just cycling cards you're just cycling drawing three four cards every turn now you could get unlucky maybe you just don't have enough mana to keep cycling your cards hitting your land drops is actually fairly important because if you hit your land drops in the first three four turns it really enables an, an absurd amount of digging through your deck just drawing three four five cards every turn through those third four fifth turns of the game is pretty powerful Against Tron, Tron's weird. Uh, again, counter spells can cause you grief. A lot of these have access to Bojuka Bog. Some of them have relics in the sideboard. You can actually still get there, but it's tough. Uh, one thing you do definitely want to remember is a lot of these are going to take advantage of Ghostly Flicker, Shenanigans, and other various graveyard shenanigans. And keeping that in mind, you're definitely going to want to bring in your Fairy Macabs because that could be a way maybe you can sneak out a win. Mono Blue Delver, eh, basically same thing as is a Delver as far as we're concerned. I've already kind of broken that down. Yeah, there's some nuanced differences, but whatever. Burn, oh yeah, 
good times. And by the way, apparently black red burn is getting popular, which is cool, but it doesn't matter. Black red burn, good old fashioned mono red burn, you don't care. Their strategy is to do direct damage to your face. And you love it because you're going to pop off not of the bone. And, you're, and you know what? Your intelligent opponents are just going to scoop. And your, your, your opponents who just want to waste time and just just shed more tears for you to to consume like the Dark Lord Cthulhu or whatever, they'll hang around and wait for you to flash back that Knot of the Bone, cycle more creatures, and play another Knot of the Bone. And in the game with like 60 life against a burn deck. And yeah, it's just great. If, you, if you're matched up against burn, a lot of the time you're going to be getting there. Now, maybe you get real unlucky and you don't draw an Knot of the Bone. Well, that's too bad. That's just too bad. It is nice to have a few copies of Duress, Raven's Crime. These are all things that if you do have access to, they're pretty sweet. Um, you could try to get greedy and find some other form of life gain, but for the most part, you don't really need to because if you just hit one knot of the bone, usually you're going to be just fine. So, and on the averages, you will. You'll find one, at least one knot of the bone, at least two out of three games, usually, which will usually get you there. So, elves, you can really, really punish some elves pretty hard. Again, all of these decks, a lot of it just has to do with uh, Relic of Progenitus use. It's interesting because it looks like we're starting to see a little bit less Relic out there. So, if you want to try this deck out, if you want to try something a little bit wacky, this is probably the most optimal time to do it. Because people seem to be getting a little bit greedy on their sideboards. And there's not as much Relic out there as there probably should be. Against Elves, you have a you, it's just a good time because you can board in Evan Carr's Justice and your main deck plan of Songs and the Songs of the Dam plus Crypt Rats is just gonna get it done a lot of the time. Inside Out Combo is it's weird. I don't know how else to describe it. It's just weird. Um, so they have they have counter spells. Uh, you really need to hit your land drops. You really need to be able to to work through. It's probably maybe worth having like a couple copies of Gut Shot or something like that in your sideboard just because if they're able to shut down your plan um, you also have these moments pieces so maybe they try to Giga Drouse you and tap all your stuff out. I mean, there's just a lot of weird elements. If you get a Crypt if you get crypt Rats in play you know now you force the issue where they have to kill your Crypt Rats. They do have sideboard options for that. I will say in the main deck they usually don't have a ton of outlets to kill Crypt Rats so getting Crypt Rats in play and just kind of hanging out with a Crypt Rat in play can cause them some fits and then if they kill it jam another copy and you know as much as you can usually crypt rats on board gives them a lot of fits also they have to giga drows or have enough counter spells to shut down all of your moments pieces the other weird part of it is they're they're utilizing a combo where there's a certain cap on how much damage they can they can functionally do so even if they have like you know nine cards in hand let's uh Let's do some fancy. Let's do fancy math. Are you guys ready? Ready for fancy math? 4 times 9 equals 36 plus 1. So 37 life. So it's not that hard for you to get 50 or 60 life in a relatively short amount of time with this deck. So if they don't kill you pretty quickly, sometimes you can just outstretch what they can do to you with Knot of the Bone. But if they get an early combo off really early, sometimes you're just not in a position to do much about it. So again, this might be a reason to add some gut shots to the sideboard. I don't know. I don't know. See, see what you think. You also have to remember this is a combo deck. Kind of a combo deck. I don't know if combos... It's sort of combo. I don't know how much it's really combo, but it's kind of combo. Anyway, all nuances of archetype branding aside, the point is, with these kind of decks, you don't want to fiddle too much with the core of the deck. You don't want to be, like, bringing in, like, seven sideboard cards, usually, because you're going to often dilute what you're doing. I mean, there's nuances here. Sometimes, like, if you're bringing in Stinkweed Imp and Fairy Macabre, you're bringing in creatures out of your sideboard to replace creatures in your main deck, and these are also creatures that, that sort of functionally help you with your, your game plan, so if you can come up with any other creative sideboard options that are based on creatures, that's pretty sweet, because that's really what you want to make sure is you keep a critical mass of creatures in your deck so that the Songs of the Damned continue to do what they do, which is, for black mana, add one uh, black for each creature in your graveyard. Wow, should have said that earlier. If I didn't, I apologize. Anyway, uh, blue-black control. Again, the counterspells counter spells can ruin your day if you can play around those. Sometimes you can blow them out. Also, this is usually not great just because these tend to have Bojuka Bogs. This one doesn't. Again, man, people are being so greedy with the graveyard hate right now. Maybe, maybe now is the time to do the crazy shenanigan songs of the damn stuff if you're going to do it. Maybe it maybe still doesn't work out. Affinity, you're going to have a pretty good game against 
kind of if they don't blow you out but if it's just like they don't have usually they don't have more than one or two main deck counter spells in the form of metallic rebuke so if they get greedy and try to blow you out with an atog you just fog and laugh that they ate all their artifacts and now they just did nothing and they're gonna lose also um, they like to like crap out a bunch of four fours and then you just songs the damn play crypt rat and blow them all up and laugh I mean you have a lot of ways to ruin their day out of the sideboard relic of progenitus and you don't really care about any of this crap besides relic what they can have though is dispel the spell can give you fits because if you think you're about to GG them by fogging at an optimal time to shut down an atog and then they dispel your fog and you don't have enough mana to flash it back again well you could get blown out so watch out for dispel could be a problem let's see here what do we have we're that's probably about enough we'll cover a few more things uh yeah, we'll cover okay is it blitz making sure you've got your fogs where you know that's very important on board crypt rat also gives them fits although they might they've usually got some lightning bolts and stuff to blow up your uh, crypt rat so you might just be better off to wait for them to play creatures then deploy your crypt rats blow up their creatures try to keep getting crypt rats and getting them back from the graveyard and just frustrating their plans that way maybe kind of sort of keeping again having enough access to knot of the bones like if they attack you for a big hit but they don't do enough to kill you that's when you want to utilize knot of the bone versus if you know you're going to die then you have to fog but you kind of want to if you have the ability to either play knot of the bone or a moment's peace you want to think about how much damage you're taking and don't just automatically fog sometimes it's better to play moment's peace and keep uh, i'm sorry play knot of the bone and keep up that moment's peace as a fail safe although they usually have access to dispel a lot of these also run days Let's see if we've got days. Yeah, here's a couple days. So don't get blown out by days. Remember, you might need to have three mana to play your moment's piece. And then, of course, Dispel can also give you fits. So just watch out. Watch out. Watch out. Last up, Mono Black. Uh, Mono Black's weird because usually they're going to have Bojuka Bog. Again, man, I can't believe how greedy people are getting. There's no relics and only one Bojuka Bog. That's really not too bad for you. What makes it weird is because it's mono black, they can have multiple copies of Bojuka Bog. They could also have Relic in their sideboard. So they're situated where they could have a boatload of Graveyard Hay, basically. However, they're super dirtily. I mean, we're just this is just the just the most ultimate dirtily, and they have tons of removal in their deck, which is just a bunch of dead cards. So bunch of dead cards plus a bunch of dirtily creatures that can't pressure you very fast. And if they get greedy and they don't have a lot of graveyard removal, this is actually a sweet matchup for you. So yeah, uh, if you wanna if you wanna tinker, if you wanna have some fun, um, I'm just gonna slowly I guess tell you my list here. I've never 5-0'd with this, so it doesn't exist anywhere out in inter internet land that I know of. And I'll just be honest with you, I'm too lazy to actually type up the deck list in the notes. I got too much going on. I've been pretty busy in real life. We got four Baron Moors, four Tranquil Thickets. Just remember, four green cycling lands, four black cycling lands two forests three swamps just remember one more swamp than forest because i don't know swamps seem a little more important sometimes singular mountain uh, singular jungle hollow two galgari rot farms it may seem like 17 land is a little bit whoops hold on what am i doing i'm losing my mind here two jungle hollows and four swamps and three forests sorry about that so you should have a total of 20 lands which may seem like uh, I don't know to some of you that you may be like wow that's like way too much land others may be like only 20 land so you're gonna be cycling a lot which means you should most of the time hit your land drops in a reasonable manner without any problems and if you hit excessive lands that you don't really need you keep in mind that of your 20 land eight are cycling lands so at the end of the day when all of your lands are in play you've only got 12 so that's really not bad Additionally, you can early on drop a Baron Moor or a Tranquil Thicket, even though you may think, man, for ultimate value, I really don't want to play those unless I have to. Don't forget, you got two Bounce Lands. So if you have to play a couple of Cycling Lands early, later on you, you cycle into your Bounce Lands, pick them back up, cycle them out. So yeah, you usually not going to get too flooded, and you usually can take advantage of as much mana as you're able to get into play by just cycling faster and faster and faster, more and more and more. Um, four copies of Songs of the Damned, four copies of Moments Peace. Nice thing about this list is most things are fours. Keep it simple. Four Knot of the Bone, four Crypt Rats, and then I've got four Lurching Rot Beasts. We've got four Horror of the Broken Lands, 
four monstrous carabid, four deadshot minotaur, and then the only things that we're running that are not in fours, at least in my list, are two reaping the graves, three architects of will, and three crows and tuskers. The sideboard, which again is really not very well tuned at all, um, but feel free if you just need a starting point and you're not really sure what to do otherwise. We've got four duress along with one raven's crime for our discard package. We've got three fairy macabre for our graveyard hate package. We've got two hush for enchantment hate, two Evan Carr's justice to give us a little extra hate against really fast aggressive decks which can kill us before we get going. We've got one Reaping the Graves, one Stinkweed, Imp, and one Stinkweed Imp, and one Death Spark to round it out. But again, you really need to change this sideboard. Maybe some Gut Shots, maybe some, maybe some Ancient Grudges, just, just off the top, and then there's probably other things you could do that would be better also. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's, that's it. That should give you something to work with. It's, it's actually a lot of fun, I'm not going to lie. Um, I haven't played it in a while just because I've been experimenting with, with different ways to attack... Uh, the blue, mono blue and blue red Delver decks with some measure of success actually. Again, um, I don't know, like with the different decks I'm playing right now, um, uh, everything I'm playing, uh, well, almost everything I've played has been doing reasonably well against the field and just destroying those decks. So that's a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, this, this is fun and you know, like once every, I don't know, four, five, six months, it's just a a good thing to dust it off, do something completely different than most decks are normally doing, and have a great time. So if that's what you're interested in, this is a great starting point for you. I'm not saying this is the best list out there on the internet, but it is a decent one. So that's all I've got for today, folks. I hope whatever you play, whether it's this or something else, uh, you stack up a fat stack of tickets playing our favorite format, Popper. Thanks a lot. Peace.